At this, the Jew there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Anyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I'll give you, uh, which I'll give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his, his flesh to eat? He just said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remain in me, and I in them. Just the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, he just said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirits and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one, come, no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples come back and no longer followed him. You do not want to lead too, do you? He just asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the eternal words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have, have, I, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil, him and Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who the one of the twelve was later to betray him. The title of my message is The Words of Eternal Life. She was verse 68. So let's read verse 68 together. Okay, please. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Heavenly Father, as we resume our John's Gospel study, give us the precious words, the words of eternal life. Have mercy on this sinner. Clothe me with your grace to serve this message. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last time in John's Gospel, chapter 6, in December, we learned that Jesus did not come into this world to give us bread but to be bread. Jesus Christ did not come into this world to help you meeting your desires you already had before you were saved. 
He came into this world to change your desires so that Jesus may be the central desire. He did not come to satisfy all of your physical desires, but to change those desires at the core so that he becomes our treasure. So Christianity is not about using Jesus to fulfill my desires. It is not about getting God to give me more stuff and make life more pleasant. They can be a byproduct of our relationship with Jesus Christ. But that's not the main point of the gospel. So in the song, Draw Me Close to You, we'll sing at the offering. There is a refrain, you are my desire. That's a happening. No one else will do. That should be our song every day. Now, Jesus does care about our bread. Uh, I mean, physical bread. Don't misunderstand. He cares about your body. That is coming when Jesus comes again. When he comes again, he will restore all things. He will give us glorious resurrection bodies. No more mourning, no more crying, no more tears, no more depression, no more sin. Only joy on the new earth, under the new heavens. Jesus cares about our body. He's going to transform your bodies so that you can enjoy him in the fullness of your humanity. That is coming. But meeting all our physical desires today is not the main point of the gospel. But still Jesus promises to provide what we need in this world. So for example, Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So if you read in the context, all these things refer to house, clothes, and food. Jesus will provide what we need. But he did not come to this world from heaven, mainly to do that here on earth. But the crowds did not like that. They did not want to be changed. They wanted Jesus to meet their desires. They wanted to Jesus to fix their life, fix their marriage, take away their anxiety, solve their felt needs, and make them more successful and elevate their comfort level and help them to score a touchdown and things like that. So they mocked Jesus. So look at verses 41 and 42. At this, the Jews, they began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Jesus has shattered their hope for free bread, and they are upset and not at all interested in repentance, not at all interested in obedience and submission. And they understood enough to accept Jesus that he came down from heaven. But they rejected the truth. The more they rejected Jesus' words, the more difficult his teaching became. So instead of making the truth simpler, once their response was one of mockery, Jesus began to make it more difficult. He began to hide it from them. So look at verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever is this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So here, Jesus is looking forward to his death on the cross. He will give his life on the cross as a ransom sacrifice for our sins. So if a person wants to be saved, it's only a matter of believing in the person and work of Jesus Christ. But the crowd do not have any interest in divine reality. They mocked. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us flesh to eat? And the Jews were shocked by cannibalistic talk of being a, of being a vampire. So notice very close 
close parallel between verse 40 and verse 54. So I, I put these two verses side by side. You can see the comparison. Verse 54 says, Whoever is my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 40 says, Everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So you can see the parallel. So this parallel shows that in Jesus' mind, eating his flesh and drinking his blood are a figurative way of saying, believe in me, trust in me, receive me, and get your nourishment from me, get life from me. That's what, what it means. So that's why St. Augustine said, believe and you have eaten. So the pervasive offer of this chapter from beginning to end is anyone may have eternal life if they receive Jesus and trust in Jesus, treasure Jesus, and be satisfied in Jesus. So whoever feeds on Jesus' flesh, that is whoever believes in Jesus, has eternal life. So now let me look at uh, again Jesus' response in verse 54 and 54. 53 and 54. This is very important, so that's why I'm repeating again. So he said, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. So these two verses say the same thing exactly. One says it negatively, and the other says it positively. So verse 53 is negative. Very true, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man drink, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Verse 54 says it positively. Whoever is my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life. So Jesus says the same thing twice. As if he's hammering it into their thick skull. So here, what is so interesting is that he never stops to clear up their perplexity. He never stops and says, now, wait a minute, guys. Now, let me see if I can clarify that. I know it is an easy statement to misunderstand, and you might be confused. No, he does not do that. He just hammers it home all the harder. And he even makes it even more explicit, in some ways more shocking. You must eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and he has, drinks his blood. You have to understand, in Jewish mind, the idea of drinking blood is quite repulsive. Actually, it's expressly forbidden in the Old Testament. So he adds that, which even hits them harder, because their problem is not simply misunderstanding. Their problem is deep set of unbelief and rejection of the truth. They heard this definition of eating as coming, beholding, and believing. Now, believing in Jesus is not just agreeing with a certain statement about Jesus. It is about relationship with him. Just as bread sustains our life, we need Jesus for our life and energy. Just as we need the bread every day for life. I mean, in Asian people, a, you can replace with rice. Bread is rice. So we need the bread every day of our life. We need Jesus every day for our life. As you know, we, we are what we eat. All foods we eat and drink become the part of our body. Likewise, if you really accept Jesus and his words, they become my thought, my will, direction, and treasure in my heart. So it means that if you do not think, nor desire as Jesus thinks and desires, we are not accepting, accepting him yet, even though we may say habitually, I believe in him. So by actual living according to Jesus' word, I'm demonstrating that I really believe in him. So that's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Before he met Jesus Christ, Paul's desire was to become a tough Pharisee. You know, to make a name for himself, he persecuted the church of God. He, made, he, he put many Christians in jail and even killed some of them. But after meeting Jesus, he ate the living bread from heaven and God changed his desire. Until knowing Christ was his only desire. By eating the living bread, we let Jesus live within us and become part of us and transform us. So during the Last Supper, we, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So we celebrate communion to remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and let Jesus come in into our hearts. So we'll, we'll do communion next Sunday. So Jesus' teaching was clear. They needed Jesus, the bread of life, even more than the physical bread. But they only wanted the free bread from Jesus. And realizing that Jesus was not going to give bread give them free bread that day, they rejected Jesus' word of life and began to complain. And they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? The Jews rejected Jesus' words. The more they closed their hearts and minds to the truth, the more difficult his teaching became. The rejection of truth results in spiritual blindness because they would not see they could not see the Messiah right in front of their eye. So what did Jesus say to them? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about it, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Once again, Jesus tried to help them to focus more on the Messiah and his life-giving words than the physical bread. He really wanted them to open their hearts to hear his words spoken to them, the words that are full of the spirit and life. You know, some people will come to the church, but they would not open their hearts to hear what Jesus says. They always ask questions like, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? That's what the people of in this passage uh, did. When no more free bread was offered, they grumbled and would not hear what Jesus was telling them. And Jesus was sorry because of their unbelief. They would not believe even if they see Jesus ascend to heaven with their own eyes. So that's why Jesus told them, the spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The word I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit, and life. So look at verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus knew that his 12 disciples were shaken by these people's decision to leave the ministry. So he asked the 12, you do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter followed Jesus, not because his brother Andrew followed, but because he accepted the words of life. Peter's faith was based on the words of eternal life. He followed Jesus because Jesus is the living bread from heaven. So Peter was different from the crowds who focus on, on the bread rather than the Messiah. Peter listened to Jesus when he said, I am the living bread from heaven. Peter was also different from the crowds 
to follow Jesus with the ulterior motive. For example, Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, so one of the 12, followed Jesus, but he never accepted the living words of Jesus because of his greed, desire for money. He would eventually betray Jesus. There are many wise men and women in this world who write many excellent books. But Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. So Peter knew that he could find eternal life from no one and nowhere else except Jesus Christ. So this is the reason why we should study the Bible wholeheartedly. And I honestly pray that each of us may say to Jesus. So let's say to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. So the sixth chapter of John's gospel begins with the 5,000 men following Jesus. And it ends with the 11. So someone said, chapter six ends on a note of failure. So from one standpoint, that's right. The resistance to Jesus in this chapter gets stronger and stronger until almost everyone abandons Jesus. It looks like a failure. But Jesus firmly believed in God's sovereignty. God is in charge. That is why he repeats again and again. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them and I'll raise them up at the last day. All those the Father gives him will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive her away. Jesus was sorry that so many people refused to believe. But he says, I'm just going to have to rest on the sovereign purpose of the eternal God and know that all that the Father gives me will come. Jesus was saddened and grieved over their unbelief, but he rested on the sovereign purpose of God. All that the Father draws will come. And that is our confidence in preaching the gospel. In the face of so many rejection, you know, we preach the gospel, many people, thousands of people, but not many come. But in the face of so much rejection, we have to remember Jesus' words, that there is all Father's plan. And the Father has to draw before anyone will come. And when the Father draws, they will come. And the Father will do his work, or work of redemption. So whenever it appears that the resistance to Jesus is winning in this world, the people of God need a very clear vision of God's sovereignty over all things. So we can apply that to our lives. Whenever it appears in your life that Jesus is not winning, whenever it seems as though he's not triumphing over your enemies, just at that point and at the time, we need a very clear vision of God's sovereignty over us. So feeding on Jesus means that we should trust him no matter what happens. We should believe that God will make good on his promise. Namely, everyone who looks to the Son will have eternal life, and Jesus will raise him up at the last day. So in the face, in the face of seeming failures and everyone against us, we should hold on to this truth. So even if it is counterintuitive, it doesn't make sense. And everyone is against us. Everything is against us. We should hold on to God's will and his promise. Namely, everyone who is Jesus will have eternal life, and Jesus will raise him up at the last day. This is what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. So when the going really gets tough, Peter's answer is a powerful truth to remember. So when my faith was, has been most shaken, I hold to those words, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. We may not understand the circumstances we are experiencing. We may not understand why God is allowing us to go through what we are going through. We may be tempted to toss in the towel and give up. But the truth is that there is nowhere else to go. Jesus alone 
has the words of eternal life. So when you are happy, go to Jesus and rejoice in his goodness to you. When you are sad and discouraged, go to Jesus because he alone has the words of eternal life. So in conclusion, so I pray for those who are here who maybe have come and looked or are looking but haven't believed or received or eaten that they may accept Jesus Christ not only as the bread that nourishes the soul, but the blood that cleanses the soul. So it's the song we'll sing in a minute. My deep desire, no one else will do. I think Sam. So is that your song? Is that your song? Can you sing it from your heart every day? Yeah. Jesus is the all I want. So may nothing about the gospel be a stumbling block. May the gospel be a welcome message, fully embraced. So maybe today there are there are some people who have heard this message, may eat, actually eat instead of just looking. And may receive Jesus Christ as the living bread from heaven. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. May God help us to receive Jesus as the living bread from heaven and eat so that we may have eternal life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.